Parks like this are a real blessing for city dwellers, not least because of the chance it gives us to encounter birds like this, not the sort of birds you're going to see around your home or, or garden. As children, I think all of us enjoyed coming out to feed the ducks and the geese and the swans. And of course, um, this greedy lot, well, they really come to rely on the handouts, don't you? Here in Kensington Gardens, in the heart of London, there are also plenty of pigeons and starlings about. And they sometimes cause a bit of a nuisance if you want to just sit outside and eat. But getting close to our less timid bird life is something we all generally enjoy. One of the most common birds to be found here was the house sparrow, as this newspaper photo taken in 1928 clearly shows. This is Mr Hedges Bates, the bird man of London, feeding dozens of his little feathered friends, as he had been doing for 35 years. But today I haven't seen a single sparrow here in that same park. Throughout London they are now few and far between. Throughout the east and southeast of England, numbers have plummeted by up to 90%. The case of the disappearing sparrows has vexed many expert minds and has been a matter of fierce debate. But why should we care about the disappearance of an SBB, a small brown bird? I went to see journalist and agony aunt Claire Rayner in her North London home. Claire, why does it matter if the sparrow disappears, the house sparrow? Now, one of the reasons that sparrows matter, well, to me anyway, but I think to a lot of people, is that, that for, for centuries they've been a thread that ran from your childhood to your old age. I have grandchildren. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know a sparrow from an eagle because they've never seen either, you know what I mean? In my day, as I'm quite elderly, there were a lot of horses tootling up and down the roads. And when the chap who doing, you know, delivering stuff or whatever he was doing stopped, he'd hang a nose bag over his horse made of lovely plaited straw. And the horse's nose is there, he could eat, eat his oats. And every so often the horse goes, <laughs> and up would come the oats, a great shower, and land on the ground. And that's where, the, where you could find sparrows. In the heart of London, Soho, David Lindo combines a day job in the music business with a rising media career as the urban birder, raising awareness of the wildlife in our cities. Sparrows are very important for London because they are part of the history of London. You know, you go back all the years, back to the you know, 18th, 17th, 16th century and beyond, and the sparrow is the archetypal London bird. Cocky is one thing. They're cheeky as well, but they're also quite suspicious at the same time. But they're friendly, and they, to me, since I was a kid, have always been the little birds you see everywhere, you know? And they're just nice to have around. And when they're gone, that's when you realise how much you miss them. OK, and we all need to face this way, cos I'm... In London schools, the RSPB's Diane Mayle is enlisting younger supporters to try to save the sparrow. There's one very special bird who I've come to talk to you about today. We're going to talk about today. She brings along a friend called Charlie. <laughs> I am school sparrow liaison officer, and um, I go into schools with my friend Charlie, the sparrow detective here, and um, we talk to children about why sparrows are disappearing. Are you? None of you never seen no sparrow. <laughs> Is that right? Um, and when I go around schools, I very, very rarely see sparrows. I get extremely excited if I go to school and they've got sparrows. So what has happened to the sparrows? And can we get them back? They've certainly disappeared from Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens. But when did it all start to happen? Here in Kensington Gardens, they've been recording the numbers of different birds since 1925. Roy Sanderson took over the census project in 1975. And what was the difference in sparrow numbers between 1925 and 1975? That was 2,600 sparrows were counted in, in 1925. And when we did the count in uh, 1975, it had dropped to 544. The last count was in 2005, and we had no sparrows at all. The Kensington Garden census shows a dramatic decline since 1925. This reduction has been mirrored 
to greater or lesser extent throughout the south and east of England. The areas in red are where sparrow numbers have nosedived the most. To solve the great sparrow mystery, you need to understand the bird. The house sparrow with its short bill is well adapted to forage on the corn we spill in feeding ourselves and our animals. So historically, the sparrow's success has been closely entwined with our own. But is there something we've done recently that has caused the sparrows to disappear? Roy Sanderson believes so. There's a lot has changed over the last 50 years. Um, and I think the sparrow is finding it extremely difficult to, to keep up, to, to change. The hedges have gone, the crops have changed. Many of the barns have been replaced. Many have been used now as to, for people to live in rather than to keep animals in. But horse traffic obviously had a lot to do with it. Their, their, their association with man and, and his animals, I think, is a big factor. The disappearance of horses in our cities has meant no spilled grain and no dung to attract insects. And this could explain the sparrow's decline in the 40s and 50s. But why has this decline continued? There's a suspicion that another of our domestic animals is to blame. Cats are now our favorite pets. Their independence suits our modern lifestyle. They are also expert hunters, and sparrows are a favorite prey. And if that's not bad enough, sparrows also get attacked from the air. Sparrow hawks are now a regular feature in our urban landscape. They are agile predators of small birds. There are so many theories about sparrow mortality, but because predation is an easy solution, whether it's your own moggy pouncing on a bird or the uh, sparrow hawk raiding the bird table, it's good to go for something that is easily identifiable. But what we need is hard scientific evidence. Here at the RSPB's headquarters in Sandy, they have the results from long-running studies of sparrow populations. I came to consult research biologist Will Peach. What about predators, though? A lot of people think that predators are the problem. Yeah, so predators like cats and sparrowhawks, clearly they have been shown to take, you know, in some cases, quite large numbers of sparrows, particularly the, the young, vulnerable um, fledglings uh, fresh out of the nest. Um, but in the work we've been doing, particularly in London, um, and, and other studies too, that um, we've really failed to show any any impact at the population level of these localised predator problems. This lack of overall effect on sparrow populations may be because predators take weaker birds that would not survive anyway. So if predators aren't such a big factor, what is? An important clue came from a study carried out by scientist Kate Vincent. She studied the sparrow population in Leicester by putting up over 600 nest boxes to observe sparrows as they raised their young. She noted that some broods had surprisingly high mortality rates and that there was something different about the ones that died. We were able to collect faecal samples when we handled the, the chicks to so then analyse that what diet... That so you were analysing the droppings? Yes, yeah. that's correct, yeah, mm -hmm. the droppings. Um, so we could see exactly what kind of food the adults were bringing back to them. Um, and we found that the um, broods that had a high proportion of plant material in the uh, diet were the ones that were more likely to die. What were they not getting that they needed? House sparrows need, in their first week in the nest, they need high protein. So they need insects as their main food source. And if they've been given plant material, it's indicative that there's not as many insects around that the parents can't find them. Kate found that a lack of insect food was occurring more often in gardens with concrete paving, wooden decking and mown lawns. In gardens with more deciduous shrubs, with longer grass and native species like hawthorn hedges, she found insects were more abundant and sparrow young fared better. Now, Will, how did Kate's work, her findings, how did they inform what you've been doing in London? We went to London, first of all, to check experimentally, some of Kate's findings to do with insect availability, uh, and also to, um, to see if we could actually increase house sparrow numbers on the ground. And what we've been doing is we've been feeding mealworms to um, half of our study colonies in, in London, it's about 35 colonies. We've been using these specially designed mealworm feeders, and uh, these, into there goes a simple pot 
full of nice, chunky, tasty mealworms, and these are absolutely loved by house sparrows. And this is one of the study gardens in West London, home of RSPB volunteers Ron and Rita Mardell. They have a colony of house sparrows in their street, and twice a day during the breeding season, Ron and Rita put out mealworms for the parent birds to take back to the young in the nests. A cage over the feeder keeps out larger birds like pigeons. The RSPB's Chris Orsman is coordinating this part of the project. The sparrows waste no time in tucking into the mealworms and taking them off to the nest. So, has providing this extra food had any effect? Well, we go out and survey all of the study sites to look for the numbers of juveniles that are being produced. And at the mealworm fed sites, we have found significantly higher numbers of youngsters. This is good news and shows that the lack of insects during the breeding season is indeed a factor. But unfortunately, so far, no more youngsters than before appear to be surviving the first winter to breed. What does Will Peach make of this? The lack of invertebrates during the summer period is, is one important limiting factor for these suburban sparrows. What our study is suggesting is there is one, possibly more, additional problems probably operating at different times of year. We currently don't know what those problems are, but we are working on it. Sparrows have been our close companions for thousands of years. A familiar sight and sound for generations. Now, if this supplementary feeding programme being undertaken in London helps uh, fledglings to survive, that's a step forward. But unless they actually survive the first winter, numbers may not recover. So, until we have all the answers, one thing we can all do is to improve our own gardens, creating homes for wildlife, put up sparrow nest boxes, create wild patches, and make sure a plentiful supply of food is at hand. Urban gardens are a vital breeding and feeding habitat for birds like the sparrow. To hear the cheerful cheeping of sparrow flocks in our towns and gardens once again, we all need to do our bit. Information about what you can do for sparrows and other birds and wildlife can be found at the RSPB Homes for Wildlife webpage, rspb.org.uk forward slash hfw.